Amen, family. Well, hope we're still fired up to worship God this morning. Turn your Bibles on over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, 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 did steal oh, one of the scriptures. I'm not as bitter as I was before about it. I think I'm going to be better now. So come on, come on. Now, of us here, who likes TV shows and movies? Come on, bro. Okay. So a, a, a majority of us do. Now, with TV shows and movies, I, I'm a big fan of action and thriller ones. Yeah. What, are, what, are, what are some of your guys' favorite genres of movies or TV shows? Sitcom. Sitcom? Suspense. Suspense? Historical or horror? Okay. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Okay. Right here. Horror. Horror. Absolutely. So we have all these favorite genres. We have, and, and they're always so appealing to us. It's like, I, I love this show. Right. I love this kind of genre. That kind of genre. Right. But I think something that we can all agree on is that whenever we watch a, a TV show or a movie, and there's always a story about a man or a woman being chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Chosen to accomplish their, their mission. Yeah. Chosen to accomplish some special task. Yeah. And what seemed to, of it as that they're regular people, but then all of a sudden just something miraculous happens. Yeah. And and you know they're chosen for the special purpose. Right. I find that, at least for myself, I don't know if you guys can relate, is I love those shows because sometimes I can relate to them a little bit. Yeah. I want to relate to it. Oh, okay. Us as people, we want to be chosen to do something great. Right. We, we see these shows, it's like, man, that's a regular person like myself, and I want to be chosen to do something great. Yeah. In 1 Peter 2, right. here in verse 9, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Yeah. Is even God sees us as his chosen people. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't know about you guys. When, when I was in high school, my favorite elective was PE. Yeah. I, try to, I, try to, I try to take it every year. Um, there was eventually, like, my senior year, I had one free period. And it was like uh, like the, my very first class. So I could have gone there later, like around like 11 or 10, yeah. 10.30. But I decided to take PE. Because <laughs> right? I, I thought I was like, this is my senior year. I'm like, I like PE, I like playing sports, I like you know playing basketball, dodgeball, all this stuff. And it was so fun. But what I always found was that whenever we would play dodgeball or create teams for dodgeball, for basketball, for flag football, whatever it was that we decided to play, there was always a little bit of hesitation of, am I gonna get chosen last? <laughs> just, don't, just don't choose me last. Just, and sometimes you feel really good when you're like the first one chosen. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. I was only chosen first, I think, for like soccer. But other than that, I was gonna pick like fifth or sixth for like dodgeball or anything else. So I'm like, I'll take it. But, but we love being chosen first. We love being chosen for these things. And it, it, there, there's a sense of, of gratification that we get from it. But here, Jesus chooses us. He says we are his chosen people. To call people from darkness into the light. See, we do have a special purpose in helping people call people from darkness into the light. Yeah. Now, not only does he say that, I also love in this passage, he says, we are a holy nation. Yeah. What holy is defined as is being set apart. Mm. And really what we are as God's people today is set apart from the world. Amen. We are of the, we are here in the world, but not, not of the world. Yeah. Mm. Is we don't partake in the things that the world says is cool or will make you happy. We don't partake in that. Mm -hmm. We understand that our value comes from God. Come on, that we're set apart. Yeah. And But here's the thing is, us trying to live righteous lives, mm. that can be difficult. Mm. Living, living a, a life according to what God wants us to do, what the Bible calls us to do, that can be difficult because it, it, it seems almost impossible at times. Right. Yeah. That there are so many other things in this world that are pulling our attention, catching our eyes, that we want to go do that. And sometimes we feel, well, that seems fun. 
my purpose could be in that. We have to see our purpose is in God. Amen. God has chosen us to do something special. The title for my lesson for y'all this morning is A Chosen People. Come on. Come on. I want to look at a story of some men who were chosen by God, but were able to overcome the difficulty that they found themselves in. Go to Daniel chapter 1. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, Daniel 1. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And let's pick it up here in verse 1. Got it, bro. He says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon, in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what, with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. <laughs> to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could not could understand visions and dreams of all kind. Wow. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better wow. than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. The title of my first point is Chosen to be Set Apart. Now, to give some historical context of really what's going on is the, Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom had conquered Jerusalem, and there were three deportations from Jerusalem to Babylon. One was in 605, the other one was in 597, and the other one was in 586. So three times Babylon came into Jerusalem and took Israelites, but of note, they only took Israelites who were of nobility and of the royal class. Mm -hmm. So when Nebuchadnezzar, or he sent his chief official Ashpenaz to go grab the people, anybody who was poor or a farmer or just of like middle to low class status stayed over there. Mm -hmm. you know, we, have, we want nothing to do with you, but we want the prominent people. <laughs> and to be fair, this is probably why Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom lasted so long and was so powerful, right. is he had so many people of different cultures and of the different places he had conquered to give him guidance and wisdom into different situations that he found himself in. But here it says they brought the Jews over from Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that they weren't the only, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, it's not like they were the only Jews to be brought over. There were about 20,000 out of all like three deportations. There were three or uh, 20,000 accumulative taken from that. Wow. 20,000. Wow. But Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael 
were the only ones who decided to stay faithful to God. And the Bible takes note of that. That's why he names them. Yeah. It says that there, there were other Jews, not to be mistaken, there were other Jews in the presence of the king. Right. There were other Jews being trained to serve under King Nebuchadnezzar. Yet, Daniel, these four men were the only ones to say, no, we got to follow God. Wow. I'm not going to eat any of the food. I'm not going to follow any of the practices. I still have to remain this way. Amen. All the other Jews were quick to leave and drop their religious beliefs and the right and the righteous way of living. And just, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll, I'll do what, whatever I need to do just to survive. Yeah. They had such little faith in God. Wow. Yeah. Now, to kind of add on this note, it says here that they wanted to eat only vegetables and water. Yeah. No one's really fired up about that. <laughs> <laughs> come on, bro. Come on, man. Not it. I wouldn't be either. I was like, that sounds horrible. I don't want to eat like carrots every day. Oh, like, awesome. I just, I love no. Carrots. Or even celery. I'm like, okay, celery, but if I have a little bit of peanut butter, like then, then I can maybe do it. Or like carrots with like a little bit of ranch. Okay. But just solely by themselves, I'm like, that's so crazy. But it's not like the Jews had were vegetarians or vegans. Now, why did they not want to eat? Why did these four men not want to eat the meat that was given to them? Was because before the meat got to them, it was dedicated to the Babylonian, the Babylon's pagan gods. Wow. Yeah. That it was dedicated to them first, so they would have found themselves in ceremonial uncleanness mm. by eating that food. Mm. That even if, it, even though it, it was dedicated to foreign gods, I st I'm not going to touch it because wow. that would leave me unclean. Mm. That's how, where their conviction was at. Come on. And in a real way, this represents us today. Mm. Is that they were pulled out of a nation that they knew for so long that they could live in peace and harmony and worship God all they wanted. Yeah. The Babylon nation hated anything that was monotheistic. They were very polytheistic and very pagan in nature. So they did everything in their power to make them feel like they were belittled. Wow. And they wanted them not to hold to the standard in which they were called to. Wow. In the same way today, when, you know, us wanting to live righteous lives, is with the Jews here, again, like I said, they weren't the only ones who were in the king's presence. They were the only, these four were the only ones who decided to stay faithful to God. Wow. Now, but that being said, is we, we have to understand that when they, these Jews, the ones who decided to move away from God's teachings, they didn't even give room for God to work. Wow. It's not like when Daniel left and the, you know, Hananiah, the, the four, went to Babylon, it's not like they, God told them, sent them a text message, DM them, slipped them a note in their pocket, said, hey, by the way, the chief official, he's going to like you guys, and you guys are going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. God said nothing. Wow. He, didn't, he didn't tell them anything. Yeah. Yet Daniel knew all four of them understood that God is going to take care of me. Yeah. See, whatever difficult situation we find ourselves in life, Oftentimes what we do, and even for myself, I can just run to discouragement, run to sin, or run to whatever vices we have in our lives rather than giving it to God. Sometimes we don't even give God a chance to work in our lives. Sometimes instead of immediately going to God, we go immediately to sin and not even give God a chance. Not even give God a chance to work in our lives. See, when we find ourselves in, in difficult situations, Really what it is, is there's a lack of God in our life. Mm. Mm. There's a lack of guidance from God. Because God wouldn't want us to be in these difficult situations. Or at times he does. But he wants you to come out the other end righteous. Yeah. He wants you to come out of the other end successful. Yeah. It's not whether we're going to get difficult times in our life. It's really how are we going to respond. Yeah. Are we going to want to resolve these issues? Yeah. On, are we going to want to overcome this sin? Daniel and, the, and these four men really set a great example for us that we can't just run to sin, but we have to, God, be God. We have to let God take these difficult situations and really trust him. Yeah. I know for myself that, you know, the, the special missions goal, I think, was very big. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely found myself in a situation where I was like, how much was that? Like, it was, I was like, 
because normally we break it up into you know smaller portions or this and that. And normally I'm like, okay, this is awesome. Like we can give this. I can budget for this. I like to budget. Yeah. And oh, nice. I'm big budgeter. I just I have spreadsheets. All anyways, I I really like to budget. Is what I'm saying. And when when the special missions school was announced, I was like. Money don't work. How? Like I, I'm, I'm like thinking, okay, how are we going to? How am I going to figure this out? How am I? But I realized that immediately I went to doing some math, looking at my budget, rather than just praying and believing that hey, God can do so many, so many great things in such a small amount of time. God loves bad odds. You know, throughout the entire Bible. It always looks like the Israelites are going to die or they're not going to overcome their situation. Right. Yet every single time, they come out faithful. Come on, they God. come out better. Yeah. They come out stronger. Yeah. In the same way, the way we're going to be set apart is by whatever obstacles and difficult situations we go through, we have to get guidance from God, yeah. godly mm -hmm. people in our lives, yeah. to give us a proper direction yeah. of where to go. Come on, yeah. See, I want to challenge us is really what that looks like for the disciples is to continuously have quiet times. Come on, bro. Our quiet times, our praying and reading every single morning is vital yeah. to having a great relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate what Richard said earlier about like, you know, marriage and having a relationship. Because if I were to tell you, Abby and I just recently got married. But, but if I told you guys, yeah, you know, we get married in a month and, you know, things are looking good. And you were to ask me, oh, that's awesome. Like, you know, how's the planning going? Or, you know, how's it been going talking with Abby? And I were to tell you guys, well, I don't know. I haven't talked to her in like a month. What? <laughs> that would be your reaction. <laughs> exactly that. Is you'd be like, what are you doing? I think, I think he's lying. I don't think he's <laughs> She's gone. Like, she left. Like, like, you guys would, you guys would look at me and be like, what? that's terrible. But what we fail to understand is that sometimes, she agrees. But what we fail to understand is that that can be us with God. Is we're like, I love God. I, I thought about him. I, you know, I, I said a prayer in my mind. Imagine you said, yeah, mom, I love you. I haven't called you in such a long time, but I thought about you. Or, or yeah, yeah, like, I, I, I love you. I, I, but I haven't talked to you in a long time, but I thought about you. You know, I said a little, like, prayer about you. Like, if I treated my relationship that way with Abby, I would, we wouldn't be married. But in the same way with God, we can't treat it that way. But sometimes we treat it that way. It's like, God, God's got me. God will take care of me. I don't really have to do anything. Like, I'll pray here or there. I'm involved in, like, a church, this, this. But we don't actually get into the Bible. The Bible isn't just meant to collect dust on our shelves. Come on, yeah. That's the way we talk to him. Yeah. The way he, hear, he hears us is through prayer. The way he communicates back is through his word. Amen. Amen. See, any great relationship is built off of great communication. Yes. Yes. And in order for us to have a great relationship with God, there must be great communication. Yeah. Now, with this, in order for us to be set apart from the world, in order for us for us to be set apart, there must be a great relationship with God. Is yeah. if it, this is your first time, second time coming out of church, get into a Bible study. Yeah. Really like a, examine yourselves, but see what God wants from you. Yeah. Where do I need to go in order to get a stronger relationship with God? Amen? Come on. Yeah. Chosen to be set apart. Let's keep going here. Let's actually pick it up in verse 6 in chapter 1. Let's go, bro. Verse 6 says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. The title of my second point, Chosen to Have a New Identity. Now, sometimes we can struggle with our identity. Where, whether it's, is it my, we can struggle with our identity in work, we can struggle with our identity in these different things. Now, what this says is, obviously, like I said, the Babylonians, they didn't like, 
they didn't like the Jewish culture whatsoever. They thought having like one God was seen as weak. They thought you should have multiple. They practiced in very many pagan traditions I won't get into this morning. But they had so much, and they really didn't like the Jews. And looking at this is we would normally look at this and them changing their names. So when Nebuchadnezzar changed their, these four men's names, many scholars believe, hey, it was simply because they wanted to have them fit better into their culture. They wanted to have them fit better into the Babylonian culture, which is partly true. But really what King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do was he wanted to belittle them. Yes. See, their names were where they found their identity in God. Check this out. Yeah. Daniel meant, yep. God is my judge. Wow. Yeah. Hananiah meant, God has been gracious. No. Mishael, who is what God is. Mm. And Azariah means, God has helped. Wow. Now, Nebuchadnezzar knew this, and he wanted to change their names into the complete opposite of what that would be. Wow. Belteshazzar means Baal protects his life. Dang. That's one of their gods. Dang. Shadrach means the command of Aku, another one of their gods. Mm. Meshach means who is this or who is what Aku is. <laughs> and Abednego means servant of the god Nabu. Dang. Is He wanted to take their identity and completely change it. Wow. In the same way, what the world wants to do is take our identity and change it to something else. Wow. Wow. See, I believe that we never really find our true identity right. until we give ourselves over to Christ. Yeah. That's where our true identity is found. Right. Because when we're in the world, we're left to our own vices, we're left to our own struggles, yeah. and what we get into is just, well, they think this is cool, they think that is cool, so I'm gonna go partake in those things. Yeah. And we find our identity in these different scenarios and different situations, and we struggle. Come on, we show them to be like, what, what is my purpose? Yeah. Who am I really? Yeah. What am I really meant to do here? Right. Because the things that we're applying ourselves into the world don't actually give us proper purpose. Yeah. True. Yeah. You know, I especially find this true even with people coming to college. Yeah. Is people going to college, We people want to find their identity in college. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try everything that I had never been able to try before. I'm going to, you know, find out who I really am. And really what happens is I've seen too many of even my friends who I see, like, who graduated years ago, where I, I see them in no better place yeah. than where they started. Mm -hmm. If anything, the place that they started was way better than where they're at now, right now. Mm -hmm. Is because the world can never provide us with a proper identity. Come on, Come on. Come on. The world is never going to be able to provide that. A true identity is found in God. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of us, we were so infatuated with the idea of like, you know, being a new me, new me, new you, new this, new that, new that whatever. <laughs> like, we're, we're so infatuated with this idea of, oh, I want to be new. Yeah. And the reality is that we can. That's why I think New Year's Eve is so big, mm. is like such like a, a big celebrated holiday. Right. Come on, bro. Don't worry. Come on, bro. Because we want to get into the new year, mm. and it, I want to become a new person. I want to be, it's going to be a new me. You know, whenever there's a, a New Year's Day party, the next month, there's always, or that month, there's always a rise in gym memberships. <laughs> there's always a, a significant rise in gym memberships. Where it, it's like, my gosh, there's so many people at the gym. I remember one time when I lived in Sacramento, uh, the, like, the day after New Year's, or like a few days after, I went to the gym, and... I was already working out before that, okay? But I go and I'm like, why are there so many people? <laughs> like, like all of a sudden I had to wait to use the squat. I had to like, and I went kind of, I went around like seven, eight in the morning when nobody goes there. So then like I could, I could have time to like use everything I need to do, but it was full. I'm like, what? Like I had to actually like wait for things and then it was a little frustrating. But then like two months later, going back, I, I didn't, there, there, nobody's there. <laughs> oh, God. See, because when we, when we try to do things ourselves, it never works. Yeah. We can never do things ourselves. We need God. We need to find our identity in God. And, and what that looks like for us to find our identity in God 
is doing what he asks. Yeah. See, us applying ourselves to God's will is us actually being able to find our true identity. You know, you will never find, God has three responses whenever we pray for things. It's either yes, no, or not yet. Now, many of us normally think whenever it doesn't happen immediately, it's okay, God's saying no. He doesn't, he doesn't want great things for my life. He doesn't, he doesn't want me to, to get married. He doesn't want me to do this. He doesn't want me to, to graduate. And immediately we get so discouraged and just, oh, he didn't respond. Sometimes God just wants to test our perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to say, are you willing to wait to find your true identity in Christ? Wow. Yeah. Are you willing to wait to find your true identity in me? Come on. And really what it takes is applying ourselves to God so that we can find our true identity. Come on, Come on, Let's keep going. Let's go to our, our third point. Come on, bro. Chosen to preach the message Ooh. of repentance. Ooh. Go to Daniel chapter 3. Come on, Come on bro. Oh, boy. Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Daniel 3, and let's pick it up here in verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made in, or my apologies, Daniel 2. Daniel 2. Come on, bro. 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 Daniel 2, and let's pick it up here in verse 1. It says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants a dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Hmm. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. Skip down to verse 12. It says, This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. Wow. So... Chosen to preach a message of repentance. Now, first off, we find ourselves, at least, well, we don't, but these people do, find themselves in quite a dicey situation. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he calls in his wise men because he wants to figure out what it was. Now, this dream troubled him so much that he says, all right, I need you guys to interpret this dream for me. And they're like, okay, tell us what the dream is. And he's like, no. <laughs> I'm going to have you guys tell me what I dreamt and then you guys have to tell me what it means I don't know what happened that morning maybe he woke up on the wrong side of the bed because at the end of it he's like alright you guys can't tell me I'm just going to kill all of you guys so then maybe he didn't get his breakfast of choice I don't know but sometimes that could be us in the mornings where we need our coffee or we need our, our breakfast or we need this or that. Now, now now here's the thing is these astrologers are like, we, we can't do that. There, there's no way we're able to do this. And he gets so mad that he orders all of his wise men to be executed. Oh. Now, what happens is Daniel and you know the rest of the four are within this party of people, but they weren't in the party that went to go visit him. He had like a great number of wise men. He just called a few in his presence at that moment. So as the chief, as the uh, chief official was going around collecting all the wise men to have them executed, he eventually gets to Daniel's house, and I don't, we won't read it. But he eventually gets to Daniel, says, "Hey, basically, that you know, I have to. Sorry, dude, I kind of got to kill you now. So you know, can I get things? Let's go. Actually, you can leave it here. So let's just go." <laughs> and Daniel's like, "Okay, well, what's going on? Amen. Tell tell me what what's happening." And the chief official tells Daniel what's going on, and Daniel says. Give me one night. Mm -hmm. Let me go pray to God, and God will give me the dream and the proper interpretation of 
what it means. And Daniel just does just that. Let's pick it up here in verse 29. In the same chapter. 29 says, As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large, dazzling statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the feet, the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Mm. Now, what the dream was, is that it was of this enormous statue. Now, I won't, I won't read or get into details of it, but really what it represents is the future of the different kingdoms that were going to supersede, eventually, the Babylonians. Yeah. After the Babylonians, it was the Medes and the Persians, then it was the Greeks, and then it was the Romans. Right. Now, Daniel tells him this dream, and at the end of it, King Nebuchadnezzar says, this is incredible. He gives him a, a robe, he sets him in charge, he sets him in charge as one of the, his highest ranking officials, and you would think that, wow, this message that God gave Nebuchadnezzar would, uh, of the, the nations of Presidium would be so clear, but it, necessary, it wasn't necessarily, check this out, keep going, go to chapter 3. Daniel 3, pick it up here in verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, what we see here is that obviously the what had happened was Nebuchadnezzar gets his dream and says, wow, that's, that's awesome. That's incredible. And he immediately goes and makes a gold statue, something of himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's so awesome. You're saying I'm that head of gold? Okay. <laughs> and, and he goes and he builds a large statue of himself or, or possibly one of their other gods. And he says, wow, this is incredible. And when we think, man, this was so simple, it clearly wasn't really talking about you, but was giving like a prophecy about the future, about other kingdoms to come, yeah. yet he mistook it. Oh. And he misunderstood the, it, the, the vision, which could have been so clear. Yeah. Now what I find is that really the message of God can be like this for people. Yeah. The message of God is simple. It's faith, repentance, baptism. Come on. Is, that's, that's really what it's summed up to be. And God's message is so simple, yet sometimes people have such a difficult time understanding it. Right. Is that way, like, so immediately when it can get applied, when, it can, when we study the Bible with people, and we begin to apply the scriptures into their lives, it, sometimes it can be like, wait, so what does that mean? Like, how do I, what do you mean deny myself? Like, what does, <laughs> what does that really mean? <laughs> and we could get all ethereal about it. It's like, well, it's pretty simple. Just don't do that. Like, don't do that. that thing, yeah, don't do it. Just don't, don't do that. And it, it, it could be so simple of repentance. Hey, changing your life from living one way to now living the way God wants you to live. And at times it's like, well, repentance, but like, really from like what? Like, what do I really? And sometimes people think, oh, repentance, it means to feel bad. Like, I, I grew up thinking that, oh, repentance, what repentance means is, like, to feel bad. Like, you know, I felt bad, and then I, like, confessed it. And that's, I repented. That, that's not what repentance means. Mm. Repentance in the Greek means, met, means metanoia. Mm. It's a radical shift in mind and heart. Mm. Where it goes from living one way to immediately living another way. Mm. Now, you might not see changes immediately, but you've changed your way of life. An example I could use of this is if 
somebody weighs like 300 pounds mm. and they're like, you know what? I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop eating unhealthy, I'm gonna start going to the gym. The next wave, they're not gonna weigh like 150. <laughs> but over, but they've already changed their diet and they've changed in going to the gym routinely. Yeah. And, and that's what repentance really is. The message of Christ is so simple. Yeah. To have faith and to repent. Yeah. To change our way of life. Yet sometimes it can get so difficult for us when we're studying the Bible with people. People can be like, well, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what this means. How, do, how does that apply? But really, it's not a mind issue. I, I, don't, I don't think people are really that stupid. So like, she's like, it's really not that hard to understand, yeah. but it's a heart issue. Yeah. Yeah. Check this out. Go to Mark chapter 6. Come on, bro. Mark 6, and let's pick it up here in verse 14. Come on. Come it on, says, on. King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and others still others claim he is a prophet, like one of the prophets long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I, ha whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to, jo to have John arrested, and he had, been, had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him because she was not able to. Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard of John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So here, what's going on is that King Herod, King Herod was a, a very intellectual and smart man. Mm. It's not that he, like, he didn't know what was going on. Mm. It says here he married his brother's wife. Wow. So I mean, I would hope that we all think that's a bad thing to do. Right. <laughs> and yeah, it, John said, hey, you're, you, you can't do that. And, and it says every time he preached to Herod, every time he spoke about God, he like enjoyed it, but he was confused. It's like, I love what you're saying, but I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> but it sounds, it sounds super cool. I have no idea what, it, what you're talking about, though. Hey, and what we realize is that it's never a, a mind issue for people. It's a heart issue. Yeah. 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 Is that sometimes people just don't want to understand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't really want to change our lives. Because really what, what discipleship, what God calls us to do is really change our lives. Yeah. Now is changing our lives really as simple as we think it is? No. We have to stop doing one thing and then immediately live Christ-like and begin living a new life. That's not easy. And it, it's easy to understand. But we, sometimes we don't want to get our heart there. Yeah. And it's difficult for, for people to get their heart, heart there. One person I really appreciate is CJ. Yeah. 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 Studying the Bible with CJ has been yeah, super, super refreshing. Yeah. Come on. I love you, bro. You're awesome. <laughs> and it, it, it was encouraging because he came into the studies, and you know I got in there at, at, like, at some point, and we were studying, and CJ was really wrestling with the scriptures. Mm. But he, he's a smart guy. I knew he understood it. Even coming into the Bible studies, he was like, I mean, this makes sense. It's very black, it's, it's, very, it's very black and white, what the message of God really is. Come on. Yet CJ found himself in just a little bit of, of doubt and a little bit of, well, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I should do this, I gotta go back and kinda talk with, uh, with a few people about this, I gotta, what, what is, like, is God really wanting me to do this? And we sat down, we talked, it's like, bro, it, it's a heart issue. Yeah. Is that you, uh, he understood the message entirely. Yeah. Yeah. But there was still a little bit of hesitation. It's because his heart wasn't there. Yeah. And what I appreciate about CJ is that after that, we were like, bro, go pray, go read, really dive into the scriptures yeah. and, you know, find out, man, word, what does God really want from me? You begin to invest yourself in the scriptures. 
as TJ did that, then we met with him. He's like, I'm ready. Let's go. Because he go from wrestling with the scriptures to understanding it's so clear. Now, that can not only happen with people studying the Bible, but that can also happen with us disciples as well. Yeah. And sometimes there's a very clear area of our character that we have to change. Yeah. Come on. Maybe it's having more humility. Come on. Maybe yeah. it's having a heart of servitude. Yeah. Maybe it's having grace. Maybe Come it's on, being bro. gentle. Maybe it's being more confrontational. I don't know. Only you know really what it is, the areas that you must grow in. Come on, bro. And what's funny is that God will make it so clear what we have to change in. But at times it will be, do, do you really mean that? Hold on. Maybe, maybe he means, oh, I know I got to do that. But maybe it's this instead. And, and we, we get so like, I, I, uh, I don't know if it's quite that. Because really our hearts just don't really want to understand. Yeah. Yeah. We understand it intellectually, but our hearts don't want to change. Yeah. Family, if we want to be a chosen people, a chosen people who are meant to preach a message of repentance, a chosen people to have a new identity, and a chosen people to be set apart, really what we're going to have to do is change ourselves to be a chosen people. To God be all the glory.